Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to talk about the Antichrist. This is a concept that uh, primarily comes from other Christian churches, especially the evangelical world. It's the belief that there's a prophecy, that there's going to be a one-time, one-person Antichrist that's going to make his appearance before the Second Coming. For some reason, there are members of the church that have chosen to believe that, even though it's never taught by our church. <clears throat> They'll say, well, look, it's in the scriptures. And of course, uh, it's in the way that you choose to read the scriptures, the way that you interpret them. But being that we are a separate church from other Christian churches, we have our own interpretations of scriptures, and those particular scriptures already have interpretations. I haven't talked about this for a long time because I felt like I had sufficiently covered it. But we're doing it now because I got an email from Karen McCain that sent me a quote from Robert D. Hales, which uh, some of you may or may not know, depending on how long you've been in the church. He was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, although at the time of this talk, he was in the 70. So it's another quote that I'm able to add to my spreadsheet called uh, Quotes, Common Misconceptions, where I have a large collection of quotes from prophets and apostles talking about this uh, antichrist concept in what it actually is and what it means. And I have enough here to say that, no, there's not going to be a one person antichrist before the second coming. We do have the concept of antichrist, which we're going to cover as we read the quote, but I'm going to read this to you and then maybe review a couple of the key quotes here, including the fact that the son of man has already been revealed. It happened at the time of Joseph Smith. Um, and then just a, a, maybe one or two pretty explicit quotes uh, that go against the idea that there's a one person antichrist that has to sit in the temple of God and uh, defile it and, you know, put a barcode on your forehead or a microchip in your hand before the second coming. OK, so before we get into that, here is the update <clears throat> on the Flood the Earth Challenge, where we're sharing copies of the Book of Mormon. The channel goal is to try to send out at least 10 copies of the Book of Mormon. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to use your Gospel Library app. Go to Scriptures, and you'll see, you'll see a Share button, which gives you a link that you can send to your friends via text, email, direct message, to download the Book of Mormon app. So we're at 6,256 copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared so far trying to push forward to 10,000. Uh, that's the ultimate goal right now. We have two new people that have joined the challenge, which brings us to 637 people that are currently participating or have participated. Um, I would encourage you to join if you haven't already. Just uh, let me know in the comments or send me an email if you've shared the Book of Mormon. Make sure to include this right here, hashtag flood, or just the word flood. It just helps me search comments and emails so I can easily find them, and then update the tracker. Okay. And then also, one other thing that I wanted to share before we get into uh, the Antichrist quote, um, I got this email or this picture from Anonymous showing uh, the other chapel. So far, I think we've only seen uh, on this channel, I've only shown the one chapel, like actual pictures um, after the Lahaina fire. But this is the other one that's like... Um, on the north side of the city. And you can see all around it, there are some uh, houses that appear to still be standing, but there's also right next to the chapel itself, uh, these burnt down structures. And it's a miracle that it didn't cross over to this side and burn this chapel. Um, this one, this particular chapel was actually closer, I would say to the fire, whereas the other one was maybe a little bit further away. Um, the way that the city is laid out, but this one is like right up against, as you can see, some buildings that burnt right next to it. So it is indeed a miracle, I believe. Okay, so, and again, thank you, uh, Karen McCain, for this quote. So I feel like we need to start here, uh, this part of the, the devotional called your, your scorecard. Okay, uh, now this is... Um, a devotional uh, at BYU. The date is January 10th, 18, or 1982. And the talk is called, This is the Way and There is None Other Way. All right. 
So, and it's interesting because we're about to talk about what uh, Antichrist is, what it means. And interestingly, we're going to be talking about BYU and the BYU Honor Code. So, uh, and you think about what's been going on at BYU lately. In fact, let's just do a quick search. BYU protest. There's been no shortage of uh, things going on at BYU like this. People dressed in angel wings shielded LGBTQ students attending BYU from protesters. So they decided to have this uh, event right here. I think it was, let's see, I think it was like a drag, yeah, drag show, you know, a drag show to kick off the, the school year. And uh, of course, being that BYU is a church or is a school that belongs to the church, and uh, most people that go there are members of the church and uh, believe the doctrines of the church and so forth, they weren't too happy about this. And so there were some protesters to come protest this. And I will say, I'm not a big fan of protesting, uh, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. I feel like protesting is just like a not a very effective way to show your disdain against something. It, it, it's basically like a very low form of making your feelings known and not very effective. And it comes across to me as just impulsive. Uh, it comes across to me as, oh, let's go to the protest because it's like a fun thing to do with your friends and uh, so on and so forth. I, I feel like it's a virtue virtue signaling thing. It's like, oh, like there's this easy way that I can go and I'll take pictures of myself and show my friends and family me protesting. And I, I just, I don't like protests and it doesn't matter the cause. I don't care if it's good or bad. I think that protesting is just silly. Um, that's just my own opinion, but you can understand why people would uh, be upset that this is happening at BYU. Right. So I guess here's like the protest against the drag show. And then on the other side of these, quote unquote, angels, which is uh, it, it just it really mocks the church by doing that. Um, anyway, you, you have this go on. You have other ones, too. <clears throat> Let's see. October of last year, BYU students joined nationwide walkout against queerophobia at religious schools. And who knows how many there ultimately there have been. Uh, the same crowd thought it was a good idea in 2020. Church headquarters. To um, go to church headquarters and shout and yell at the prophet and the apostles about uh, BYU and the honor code and all this stuff. So, yeah, okay. So let's go here to the talk. Your your scorecard. <clears throat> perhaps we can be helped by a story. Of, okay, perhaps we can be helped by a story about Johnny Miller, who recently won $500,000 in a $1 million golf tournament the first of its kind in the world. Several years ago, he came to speak to the missionaries and youth in London. The year before that, he was the British Open champion. He came as a champion. He spoke as a champion. The next year, Johnny Miller came to speak to us again. He had missed the cut on the second round of the tournament, and the headlines in the London papers and throughout the world revealed that the champion had not made it to the finals. Now he faced another group of missionaries and young people, and he had a hard time deciding whether he could make it. Like the champion he is, he decided to come. He stood, and gripping the sides of the podium, trembled all over. The first words he said were of great courage. Quote, I don't know why you feel you can go through, through life without a scorecard. End quote. And then he proceeded to give his testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to talk about our scorecards of life. Many of you here tonight have a scorecard. It is the BYU Code of Honor. I'd like to review it with you to remind you once again who you are and that you should act accordingly. First of all, when you came to this institution, you agreed that you were desirous to observe the following Code of Honor. And you made a contract saying that you would abide, the, you would abide by these rules. Let's review them quickly. 
First, <clears throat> you said you would abide by the standards of Christian living taught by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which means to love one another, to help one another. Um, in case any of you are like, well, this isn't love. This isn't love when you do this. Well, let's remember what um, let's remember what Jeffrey R. Holland said in this talk at BYU two years ago. Uh, there was something really interesting that Jeffrey R. Holland said, and uh, everyone pray for him that he's okay in the hospital. Um, I've heard from a couple of you, you that you've said that he's still there, and um, so let's just pray that everything will be okay for him. But he says here, in that spirit, let me go no farther before declaring unequivocally my love in that of my brethren for those who live with this same sex challenge in so many in so much complexity that goes with it. Too often the world has been unkind, in many instances crushingly cruel to these our, our brothers and sisters. Like many of you, we have spent hours with them and wept and prayed and wept again in an effort to offer love and hope while keeping the gospel strong in the obedience to commandments evident in every individual life. But it will assist everyone to provide su such help if things can be kept in some proportion and balance in the process. For example, we have to be careful that love and empathy do not get interpreted as condoning and advocacy, or that orthodoxy and loyalty to principle not be interpreted as unkindness or disloyalty to people. As near as I can tell, Christ never once withheld his love from anyone, but he also never once said to anyone, because I love you, you are exempt from keeping my commandments. We are tasked with trying to strike that same sensitive, de demanding balance in our lives. All right, so let's go back here to the honor code. Okay, so first you said you would abide the standards of Christian living taught by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which means to love one another and to help one, one another, which is, does not mean advocating for, condoning, joining these protests, so on and so forth. That Christian living is summarized by my sweetheart, my dear Mary, in teaching our family, her her husband and her two boys, uh, with a simple phrase, Thee lift me, and I'll lift thee, and we'll ascend together. I ask you this evening, are you lifting one another? Are you ascending? When people are down, do you pick them up? Second, be honest in all behavior. Third, respect personal rights. I might say that means both mind and body, and to be courteous and to remember who you are. Fourth, respect personal property. Fifth, obey, honor, and sustain the law. Sixth, avoid drug abuse. Seventh, comply with all college and university regulations. Eighth, obey the word of wisdom. Ninth, live the law of chastity. The reason you learn to live the law here is to prepare you to live the law of fidelity after marriage. It is the same law. It is the same principle. If you learn it here, you will have eternal families and return to the presence of God, the Father. You will listen to the voice within you when it comes to living the law of... Okay, sorry. Would you listen to the voice within you when it comes to living the law of chastity? You don't need to be given a lot of details what is proper in the dating relationship. But I can tell you this. If you have any doubts or questions in your mind of what the Lord expects of you, or if you are asking those kinds of questions, you probably already have your answer. I can give you a very simple illustration of the law of chastity. Write down the word compassion. Compa compassion is of the Lord. It's service given and rendered. It's vicariously feeling the hurt and the suffering, the loneliness, the, the depression of others. When you draw a line down the word compassion so that passion is shown, Remember that you will cross the line from compassion to passion when you touch each other uh, improperly, and you will and you will know when you cross that line. Passion is Satan's way of deceiving us into crossing that line in touching someone in a, improperly, right? Passion. You, you could say lust. It's lust. It's um, the natural man which is an enemy to God that we're supposed to overcome. You can also draw another line and you'll see a C O M P companion. Stay true to your companion. For those of you who are going into the mission field as elders and sisters, 
and you will not err. And those of us who have been married for time and all eternity, if we will listen to our companions, we will remain true and faithful. Remember that observing the law of chastity depends on a great de- depends a great deal on not touching and not engaging in improper actions. The next requirement of the code is to observe a high standard of taste and decency. The eleventh, to observe prescribed standards of dress and grooming. Here, once again, ask yourselves in terms of being dressed with taste and decency and within the the prescribed standards, for what purpose am I dressed this day? If it is to attract someone else, then you have your answer. You guys, this applies not just to BYU students. It applies to all of us. It applies to avoiding extreme styles, hairstyles, makeup, um, clothes, graphic t-shirts, whatever. These things don't just like randomly find themselves uh, on you. You decide the way that you appear. You know, when you do your hair, when you choose what clothes to buy. And you have to ask, why am I doing this? Is it because I want to look edgy? Because I want to show people how close to the edge I am of what's uh, acceptable? Um, am, you know, because there's that edge. You, you cross the line into what is just openly provocative radical, you know, against decency, for example. Just stay away from the edge. Stay away from it. Be safe. You know, but there's an even deeper problem there. It's that desire to get attention from other people. You know, trying to get attention from other people, trying to get praise, trying to get validation, trying to get whatever. Um, if you make that a priority, you're going to, if that's your priority in life, you're probably going to tend to gravitate toward those extreme styles. So you have to look inside yourself. Okay, number 12, help others fulfill their responsibilities under this code. These codes and ethics are going to remain constant. If I can give you a concept now, which you can think about through the remainder of this talk, I think it will help you a great deal. Okay, we're getting close to the Antichrist part. Okay, and it's very applicable to what we just read. Constancy amid change. 30 years ago, let's say the church was placed here and the world was here. Opposite sides of the podium. And there was a very short distance between the world, where the world was and where the church standards were. The world has gone far afield. It has proceeded way, way out, all the way out of this Marriott Center. We may have a tendency to remember where the world was and where the world is now and see the great gap or disparity and then want the the church to drift along and still keep a similar distance from where the world is. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its principles will remain constant in terms of temporal and spiritual and moral things. What we and our children and our grandchildren have to remember is that the church will remain constant and the world will keep moving. This gap is going to become wider and wider. And uh, boy, is it ever uh, right now. We we are to the point now, you guys. I just did a video. The video that I did before this one was for um, the members only portion of the channel. So if you go down here, you see my members only uh, videos. Just click on if you want to join, you click on one of these, it'll prompt you to join. If you if you have an Apple device and you have iTunes or whatever, from what I've heard, something with iTunes can like conflicts with you joining members only. So just try a non Apple device, I guess. But anyway, just click on one of these videos. I just what did one today about gender minotaurs where there's there was a new story put out today where was there there's this just really radical feminist um, quote unquote psychologist that talked about all these new different types of things that you can be, how like during one part of the year you feel like a girl and the next part of the year you feel like a boy or it's the top of your body. That's a boy and the bottom of your body. That's a girl. Just insane, insane, insane things that are going on. These things were not prevalent at the time that Robert D. Hales gave this talk. It has def the 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 gap has definitely widened to like it, it's not even just like outside the Marriott Center. It is now in the next solar system over. Okay, so 
Um, da, da, da. This simple concept is true. The world will continue moving. The church will remain constant. Therefore, be very careful. If you judge your actions and the standards of the church on the basis of where the world is and where it's going, you will find that you are not where you should be. All right, now, Antichrist. It's interesting that this comes up after he talks about the BYU honor code, um, morality, the way that the world keeps going more and more insane, right? Strong delusion. In the video that I did, we talked about that scripture in 2 Thessalonians talking about strong delusion. And believe me, people are definitely under strong delusion right now. Okay, Antichrist. Now, to help you with this, I want to talk from the scriptures about Antichrist. That's a hard word. It may help you if I give you a couple examples of what I mean. Basically, what I'm asking is this. How do you identify those around you who appear faithful, but will lead you astray? And, uh, you know, let's do this. Put it in the comments. How do you do that? How do you identify those people who appear faithful, but will lead you astray. What does that look like? What does it look like? Let me just tell you a few thoughts that come to my mind. Uh, people that question church leaders and are always playing devil's advocate, always playing lawyer with words or looking for technicalities and loopholes. That's not something that a faithful person does because essentially it shows that you are in opposition to whatever's being taught um, or what's said, a particular teaching, and you're trying to find a way around that. And so you become a lawyer and you look for what you think are technicalities in the scriptures or the words of the prophets to justify your position. Or you just outright criticize the prophet or apostle or general authority that said something, like say, uh, this happened to Jeffrey R. Holland when he gave this talk. There was a big uproar. Uh, David Archuleta uh, criticized it. Oh, and by the way, he fell away from the church after this happened. Like about it was like maybe about a year after this happened, he fell away from the church. Um, I would also say people that tend to like really try to conform themselves to the world, whether that be in speech whether that be in activities or the way that you dress or the movies that you watch or whatever. I would really doubt such a person who appears faithful, you know, maybe they go to church, they take the sacrament, they whatever, but it doesn't really line up with what they do, what they say, and uh, how much affection they seem to have toward the world. It's like what uh, Neil A. Maxwell said one time. Neil A. Maxwell, Summer Cottage, right here, 2006 Ensign, Summer, there it is. Okay, so this talk is quoting what um, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, and again, if you don't know, he, he was an apostle. So in the priesthood, in the priesthood leadership session of a regional conference, we sing the hymn, Ye Elders of Israel. The chorus contains a line, O Babylon, O Babylon, we bid thee farewell. I think this is a pretty good way to tell if someone is a true follower. If, if this is the attitude that they have toward the world. Bye. Bye. Bye, world. See you. The following... Following the singing, Elder Neil A. Maxwell spoke and expressed the thought that bidding Babylon farewell is actually one of our challenges, that too many of us like to keep a summer cottage there. Yeah, I wish I actually I had the actual talk. I'm, I'm not going to look for it, but he essentially says he's worried that too many people, you know, have a residence in Zion, but they have a summer cottage in Babylon. So meaning that well, yeah, we're members of the church, but we also like to be cool. I say that's another that's another red flag, cool. Because cool usually aligns with worldly values. And so if your main goal in life is to be cool, to be accepted, 
uh, to fit in with what society perceives to be cool. You probably have a summer cottage in Babylon, if not your main home. And actually your summer cottage is in Zion, but you spend most of your time in Babylon. Okay, well, that's enough of that. So how do you identify those around you who appear faithful, but will lead you astray? How does John describe these people? I also use the Bible dictionary. Antichrist was a word used by the Apostle John to describe one who assumes the guise of a Christian, but in reality is opposed to Christ. So tares, lookalikes, right? People that claim that they're members of the church and maybe they're doing it for social reason, reasons, you know, maybe there's some benefit for them going to church or maybe they knowingly stay in the church to cause problems. Maybe they get, they get attention at church and they like being provocative because it brings them attention, for example. Okay, that could, so anyway... Um, one who assumes the guise of a Christian, but in reality is opposed to Christ. That would be including non-members as well as members or priesthood holders. In a broader sense, it is anyone or anything that counterfeits the true gospel or plan of salvation. So say, for example, marriage between a man and a woman. That's the true, uh, that's true gospel and that's part of the plan of salvation. A counterfeit would be other types of marriage. It looks similar, kind of, because you have two people and you call it, quote unquote, marriage. But it's a counterfeit. It's not the real thing. Therefore, it means anyone who will prevent you from obtaining eternal life and who openly or secretly is set in opposition to Jesus Christ. The great Antichrist is Lucifer, but he has many assistants, both spirit beings and mortals. We sometimes think of Peter when he denied Christ, but he didn't deny him as the Savior. He merely denied his association with him because of fear of what he thought was going to happen to him uh, with his peer group. And that's what happens with many of us. We are often afraid when we don't know what is going to happen, and it has always puzzled me that anyone can have more fear of man than God. We can learn from the scriptures as John recorded. Even now, uh, even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. We will have many antichrists among us from within the church. Within. Within. People that go to church. You can't just assume that everybody in your ward or stake is um, is true, that they're that they're the real deal. President Lee used to constantly tell us that the greatest danger to the church was internal, not external. So, do you think that Satan maybe understands that? That he understands that uh, it's probably much more effective to um, infiltrate, you know, to get people inside the church to fight against the church. I think so. And I think his human agents here on earth, people that are part of secret combinations, people that are in power, people that have essentially sold themselves to him in exchange for knowledge, fame, publicity, power, riches. I think they have the, that they understand this and they know what they're doing. And uh, that's what you see going on here. And then they try to, to twist the scriptures to make you feel bad that you're in opposition to it. That you stand up for the plan of salvation. Right? They say that you, you hate because you're not advocating for, you're not becoming an ally because you disagree that um, this is acceptable within the gospel. Right? So, anyway, um, it goes on. I'm not going to read the rest of it. 
except for I think the last part. Um, the last and, prob and probably the most important when we're talking about this idea of Antichrist or anyone who rejects the teachings known to be true and leads others astray would be defined as follows. I learned this one from a I learned this one from a jet sorry this one as a jet fighter pilot out of control we simply said when we were training somebody and the airplane got ahead of, okay out of control we simply said when we were training somebody and the airplane got ahead of him many times your lives get ahead of you you're here at the university and things are moving very fast it's like a a jet, a jet fighter in a single seated plane Computers working, navigational aids, everything moving by hundreds of miles an hour, a thousand miles an hour and more, two and three times the speed of sound. You have to know where you're going, follow your, fight, your flight plan, plan, and be very careful where you fly. Uh, when we were flying low-level flights, we'd be going 300 miles an hour. It was always nice to do that because when you divide 60 into it, you can mark off five miles every minute. You can go you can go faster, but it's a lot easier just to put your little marks on the map. And you know your guidelines along the way, water towers, reservoirs, different kinds of buildings. You're flying at maybe 100 feet, 200 feet above the ground, flying from Georgia to Oklahoma or even farther. And you never come up, but you can do it if you pay attention to your guidelines. Please remember that the mistakes you're you're going to make will not be because you haven't been taught and you don't know what you should be doing. It will not be the, it will not be the equipment and the training that fail. All right. And then later there was one more thing at the very bottom. As I close, may I ask you to think of repentance as we think of the antichrist among us and remember core horror. What did he say? Religion, that's the tradition of our fathers. So I think that's very applicable now. People that criticize the past, the way that society used to be. Oh, that's just the tradition of our fathers. It doesn't have to stay that way. It's um, outdated. It's old. It's antiquated. Anyway, continuing repentance or forgiveness. It is a dis. It is a derangement of the mind yeah it's the same thing today it's the same thing today we know when we've done wrong we realize that we should not do it again because the scriptures say to us by this he may know if a man repenteth re repenteth of his sins behold he will confess them and forsake them all right anyway so it's very interesting. Uh, for one thing, the Antichrist is not this one person prophesied that has not made his appearance yet. And the Antichrist is someone that's in opposition to the church, in opposition, opposition to Christ, in opposition to the prophet and the apostles, those appointed by the Lord. Those that are in opposition um, to the gospel. Right. And it can be obvious or it can be in secret. So um, that that's really what Antichrist is. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice when we try and redefine it as a person that has to make their appearance in the last days. When this is a spiritual concept, it's about something that's real. Something that seems to be increasing day by day. That is what Antichrist is. And Lucifer himself is the great Antichrist. Um, in fact, that's a good segue. Uh, really quick, I just want to show you a couple things. I've already covered this before, but in case you missed that video. So this is found in the Joseph Smith Papers, John Whitmer History. Um, I have the link here in case you want to go see it. So it says, Joseph Smith Jr., <clears throat> uh, prophesied the day previous that the man of sin should be revealed. All right, so you get that? So on this occasion, the day before, Joseph Smith said that the man of sin was going to be revealed. And this is 
this is a term taken from the scriptures that people uh, take to mean the Antichrist, the man of sin, the Antichrist. Continuing, it says, while the Lord poured out his spirit upon his servants, the devil took occasion to make known. And by the way, I didn't misspell that. That's how it appears in the Joseph Smith papers. OK, so the day the devil took occasion to make known his power. He bound Harvey Whitlock in John Murdoch so that he could not speak and others were affected. But the Lord showed to Joseph, the seer, the design of this thing. He commanded the devil. He commanded the devil in the name of Christ, and he departed to our joy and comfort. Okay, so that's when the man of sin was revealed, and it defines who the man of sin is. It's Satan, and you could say that he was revealed at the time of the first vision too. It's basically just pulling back the curtain on who who was ultimately responsible for the great apostasy. And causing all the confusion in the world um, after the deaths of Christ and the apostles. And after the priesthood keys left. It, it was Satan. He is the man of sin. Um, this is also recorded in History of the Church. You can find this on BYU's website. This is in volume 1, page 175. On the third... This is how it, this is how it reads, okay? On the 3rd 1 of June, whatever that means, the elder from the very the elders from the various parts of the country were there uh, where they were laboring, came in and the conference before appointed convened in Kirtland, and the Lord displayed his power to the most perfect satisfa satisfaction of the saints. The man of sin was revealed. Two, and the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood was was manifested and conferred for the first time upon several of the elders. OK, so just another confirmation that on that same occasion, the man of sin was revealed. And then I wanted to read this one. This was published in the Latter-day Saints Millennial Star, volume 15, page 274. It says, don't tell me about popes and prelates sitting in the temple of God as God. One far greater than any pope or prelate is soon to be revealed, and he will claim to be worshipped as God. Now remember that this is no modern wicked man. Okay, it's no modern wicked man that is going to claim divine honors. No, it is that old serpent, the devil. He it is that will head the opposition against God and his Christ. And he, the son of perdition it is, that will be allowed a much longer chain than heretofore. And such will be the greatness of his power that it will seem to many that he is entirely loose. And yeah, that is what it feels like right now as we speak. He will be so far unshackled and unchained that his power will deceive all the nations, even the world. And the elect will barely escape the power of his sorceries, enchantments, and miracles. It is not to be expected that Satan will carry on his great warfare against Christ and his saints by means of any one religion exclusively. It is not the papal or Protestant religion alone that you have need to fear, but the great and abominable church, which you should expect to encounter, is Antichrist. Okay. And there's more, but you can uh, come to this spreadsheet anytime. The link is in the description below. Okay, the link for this is in the description below. There's always people asking how you access the spreadsheet. It, it's in <clears throat> the link is in the description of every single video. So just click on that link. It'll t it'll bring you here. And the tab that I'm looking at, if you look at the bottom, the tab I'm looking at is quotes, common misconceptions. Okay. All right, so that's what we have for uh, the Antichrist. Actually, wait, no. I, I want to I want to read a few more just because um, it's it's been a while since I've talked about this. We might as well just do a quick review of, review of a couple more. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith in Doctrines of Salvation. We are all aware that we are in imminent danger. Danger because Satan rages in the hearts of the people. This has all been predicted, and the predictions are coming true. Antichrist is, and this was written in 1954, Antichrist is gaining power 
And Satan has put into the hearts of the people, the majority of them, greed and the desire to dominate and take advantage of those who are weak. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Bruce R. McConkie. Uh, this is in Mormon Doctrine, page 40. The saints in the meridian of time, that's referring to the time of Christ, the saints in the meridian of time, knowing there would be a great apostasy between their day and the second coming of our Lord, referred to the great apostate church as the Antichrist. Little children, it is the, <clears throat> this, it is the last time, John said, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Wherefore, ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is, is it in the world. This great Antichrist, which is to stand as the, as the antagonist of Christ in the last days, Sorry, this great Antichrist, this great Antichrist, which is to stand as an antagonist to Christ in the last days, and which is to be overthrown when he comes to cleanse the earth and usher in the millennial righteousness, is the church of the devil, with the man of sin at its head. Okay. Um, also in Mormon Doctrine, pages 467 to 468, Lucifer is the man of sin spoken of by Paul, who was to be revealed in the last days before the second coming of our Lord. He is the one of whom men shall say, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroy the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? And then there was one other one. I, th I think we'll... Maybe we'll finish with this one right here. Harold B. Lee, watch that ye may be ready. One of the most significant among the other signs of which the master spoke, and about which I have often wondered, was that prior to his coming, there would be false Christs and false prophets who would show great signs and wonders in order, to, in order to deceive the faithful who are looking forward to that glorious day when the master will return again to the earth. We are actually seeing this present among us today, right? False Christs, false prophets. There were individuals, sorry, where individuals are coming forward with claims of deity for their leaders. These arch deceivers are among us. And some, of, some have come in person claiming to be God, right? Just like that scripture that people think is about a one person antichrist about um, him sitting in the temple of God and claiming to be God. That's not how we interpret it. This is president Harold B. Lee. These arch deceivers, plural are among us at the time of Harold B. Lee. And some have come in person claiming to be God. And we may well expect others to rise up to do likewise in fulfillment of the master's declaration that false Christ and false prophets would come forth. Okay, that that's going to be it. All right. But I have other ones here that you can that you can look over. The newest of which is this one from Robert D. Hales, which we we just covered. So I think that we would do well to look at the different groups, the different belief systems um, that are in the world and that have also infiltrated the church, you know, people that are, uh, secular that want to explain away the book of Mormon and call it historical fiction, for example, um, people that think that immortality will be achieved through transhumanism. I did a video about the, this like group in the church that 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 made this uh, they call it the mormon transhumanist association um you know all the all these different things you could name them all but basically if you're like in opposition to the prophet you're protesting uh, at church headquarters you um are going against known doctrines of the church you are causing people to question 
the church, if it's gone astray or um, you think that it's just outdated, it's just old men that are a product of their times, you know, it's the tradition of our fathers, that kind of thing. We've been warned about this, and that is Antichrist. Don't listen to Antichrist. If you're listening to people that question these, that question the gospel, question the prophet, question this and that, that um, not so much question, but question with with the intent of sowing seeds of doubt. Because it's okay to like ask questions about why do we believe this? Where does this come from? And then you you go and you find where that comes from. But when you're doing it with the intent of getting other people to follow you or you're just trying to cause chaos or you're trying to get people to leave the church that is antichrist that is antichrist all right that's gonna be it for this one if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below also make sure to share it and i'll talk to you guys later